All right. With that, uh, I invite all who are able to stand as we begin worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Our, our opening hymn today is hymn 652, Built on a Rock. Join in the confession and absolution. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, then, let us make our confession to God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgave us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
let us pray. Eternal God, you invite us to abide in your love and your light. Amid the cares of our lives, remind us again of your presence so that me, we may remember that we are your beloved children. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of peace with each other. Peace to all of you online. Our reading is from 1 John 1, 1, and it goes through John 2, 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father, and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie, and we do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, not only is Pastor Liz gone, but Danielle's gone, so I also get to do the kids' sermon. So any kids that are here, come on up. I think even the littles might like this one. Come on up. Oh, good, we got a bunny, too. They're coming. I love it. Did you bring that, or was that in the bag? Was it? No. I'd like your sandals. It, it was your house, it came from your house. Awesome. Look at, see, we got another stuffed animal. We're going to double, see, got another stuffed animal. We're going to double our attendance today for the children's sermon. Hi. Hi, Santi. How are you? All right. I have a question for you guys. I have something in my bag, and I want you to tell me if you know what it is. All right. You guys ready? All of you? No help from those of you out there. Okay. Anybody know what these are? Cheerio. How do you know that they're Cheerios? Because they're a cereal. They're a cereal? Have you seen them before? Yeah. Yeah. But how do you know that maybe they're not really 
Cheerios in the box. Maybe it's just a box I have. You you hear something in here? Uh-huh. Should we look inside? Mm-hmm. You want to do it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Will you look inside? You want to pull it out? Cheerios. It is Cheerios. <laughs> All right. I'm still a little skeptical. Maybe those aren't really Cheerios, but they're something else. Wow. You want to help me with something? Can you take the clip off there? Yeah. We're gonna pour some in a bowl. That's okay. You can. Can I pour them? Yeah. Here, let me make sure there's a little opening. All right. How's that? Is that good? I don't want to mess all the bowl up. All right. Can you guys feel them? Don't eat them. Just feel them. What do they feel like? They probably are dry. They need some milk, I think. Do they feel like Cheerios? Yeah, but they're hard. They are hard. Yeah. Yeah. Can you feel them? No? All right. So are we pretty sure these are Cheerios? Yeah. All right. So I have a question. So I think Cheerios are real. I think those are Cheerios. Do you think love is real? Yeah. It is real. How do you know when you see love? Because I Does it come in a box like this? Love. Mm-hmm. No. Does love come in a box? No. Oopsie. I'm dropping my Cheerios. How do we know what, if love is real? Can you feel love? Yeah. What does love feel like? It, it, be, love feels like, love feels like your love. Yeah, like somebody special to you. Maybe, do they give you a hug? Is that one way you feel love? When my little granddaughter comes up to me, when I haven't seen her, she runs up and she hugs my legs. And then she goes, do you do that? Santi, do you do that? Do you want to be picked up sometimes? <laughs> right? What else? What does love sound like? Does love have sounds? Uh-huh. Like what? Kind words. Kind words. That's a good one. Love is in our hearts. Love is in our hearts. That's exactly right. So love is also inside us. Today, we're going to talk in our story today about a a group of people that was trying to figure out if God was real and how that would help them. I think God God is real, right? God is real, but he went to heaven, but we can feel him. That's exactly right. Well, there we go. The sermon is done. (laughs) Can we pray? All right. Dear Dear God, thank you for giving us Jesus. So that we know that you are real. Help us feel your love in our hearts and with our words. And all God's children said, Amen. Thanks, you guys. And thanks for bringing your extra friends. All right. And thanks for your help. All right. If anybody needs Cheerios to make it through the sermon, we got a couple, so. You can go get the bowl. So last week, we ended our series on Psalms, and Pastor Liz highlighted in our last Psalm the way that God's word is a lamp to our feet and a guide for our lives. Does this ring a bell? Anybody? Thank you. Okay. Today, we're going to start a new series, but we're actually going to pick up on that theme of light. And instead of talking about light as a guide, um, as God's word is a light, we're going to talk about how that light ties with our relationships and how we are as a community. So I'm going to dare to tell a story about when I was in eighth grade. You know, these are the kind of stories that stay in the vault as long as possible, and you only pull them out. But this felt like a very good example for this story or for this sermon, so I thought I'd use it. So when I was in eighth grade, I was a part of this three-person group. You can already see that three eighth grade girls together could be a problem. Anybody? Right? 
Yeah, I heard, uh uh-huh, back there. Okay, so the three of us were very close. We lived close by each other and like super cool when you're eighth grade that you can take your bike if you're close enough and go on your own. So felt a little independence. It was our last year of middle school. And for basically that year, we were pretty inseparable. Most of the way through the year, I don't know exactly when it was, but one Friday night, the three of us were out bowling. This also tells you how old, you know, I lived in an era where bowling was a thing you did as an eighth grader, you know? Um, So we were bowling and I don't remember what happened, but we got into an argument and I left mad, okay? For the rest of the weekend, I didn't call, I didn't connect, we didn't have texting, you know, so we had to use the, the, landline. Um, I didn't go to their house, didn't get a mic, go visit them. Monday morning came, didn't go to their locker, didn't see them. Monday turned into Tuesday, turned into Wednesday, turned into Friday, now it's been a week, no contact. My mom kind of noticed there's a different pattern going on and she asked me, so Terry, what's going on with you and your Connie and, and Helena? And I said, I, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes or part of CSI to figure out something was up, right? Because I haven't seen him for a week now. And uh, I was pretty tight-lipped, didn't really share much. I just made, kind of mumbled something, I'm sure, and uh, kind of let it go at that. But my mom got me thinking, do I really want this? They were still hanging out together. I was lonely and hanging on to my pride, like that was gonna help. But that week turned into a month before I finally thought, I can't live like this anymore. The thing, which to this day, I do not remember what it was, had me saying I was right. But two other competing issues were also there. My pride, and my being lonely. I didn't want to admit that maybe I wasn't right in whatever the issue was, or even worse, they might have been right, or they might have had an opinion in this that I should take into consideration. But I also knew that I was by myself and I didn't like that. And that we had had this long friendship and I wasn't sure this thing was worth losing that friendship. So one day, I just decided to do something. And I walked up to their locker, said hello, did some pretty weak apology, and said, I was mad and I'm sorry, but I missed them and I wanted to be friends again. I have no recollection of what they said, but from that moment, we just moved on. And what was interesting for me is that almost 50 years later, I don't remember the details, but I still remember being reunited with my friends. And I still remember their willingness to not make a big deal of it and welcome me back in. In our reading for today from 1 John, it's the beginning of a letter or perhaps a series of sermons to a community that's divided. Maybe a bunch of eighth grade girls, I'm not sure. And the group of people are fighting over who's right and who's wrong. Who has the right understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? And the letter, the sermon begins not addressing their division, but declaring who God is and what God does. It's interesting to me that that's where they start. And it seems maybe fairly obvious. I declare to you this, right? God is light and love. And it may seem obvious to us, separated by 2,000 so years, living in a different world, that this thing should be what orients us. And yet, believe me, when I'm 
fighting, when I'm in a divided community, it's not the first thing that I think about, who is God and what does God do? It's not our natural human instinct when we're in the midst of division to sit back and wonder about God. You know, I had a pretty powerful understanding that I was right when I was in eighth grade. I thought I was right about a lot of things in eighth grade that I don't think maybe I think the same today. But there's something about our own perception of ourselves that we can think pretty highly of. And those come out, maybe not all in the best way, during times of division or times when communities aren't getting along. Perhaps you know what that's like in your own life. Maybe you felt the strain of relationships or been a part of communities that were arguing about certain things, probably more important things than my eighth grade community, but maybe not worth dividing over. Folks, division is real. Living with other people is hard. Families, relationships, friendships become strained. And maybe like me, once we get down the path of division, you can't go back and repeat. You got to navigate the complexity from there. And like me, there's the reality of whatever the issue is. But there's also then our own human pride or vulnerability or whatever we bring into the conflict. And there, there's the relational consequences that come from being in conflict. It's hard to find our way forward once we're in to division. It's hard exactly to know how to navigate it. So what does this sermon or this letter give us to help us? I'd love to mandate that everybody just get along. Not really sure that's going to happen. I'd like us all to play by the same rules or the same set of values or the same set of commitments, and then we could go back to that. While I hope for that to be true in all the communities that I'm a part of, I don't see it happening anytime soon. So from 1 John, this is my takeaway. If that's not an option, what does it mean for us to have an alternative? And this alternative, I think, is to testify to what life is like when we're grafted into or connected into God's love and light. What does it mean to be a people who see the source of our existence, God's love, or being God's light in the world? I think as we, un, as we look at that, we get a clue on what it means to live in the Jesus way or to have a full and abundant life according to God's understanding. So what does it mean to be light? What does it mean to point to light in dark times? What does it mean to share the light, or cling to the light. These are the things that I wonder about. I want you to think back for a moment to what we were talking about with the kids. How do we know love is real? It's hard to see, but we see it sometimes, don't we? Maybe not in a box that says Cheerios or love, right? But we see it in other relationships. We see it in people that are willing to go the extra mile. 
We see it in people that are willing to put their needs aside for someone else. What does it mean to feel this love? I know times when love is such a joy. And I know times when love feels like heartbreak. I don't know. What does love feel like for you? If we're honest, it's hard enough to see love, to feel love, to touch love, to be able to put it in a box so we can say, yes, this is what it is. But it's even harder to do that with God. And yet, we have a book filled with stories. We have communities for centuries that have been giving witness to this light, living out of this light, letting this light guide them in dark times. So where have you seen God in action? How have you witnessed the transformational nature of God's love in people's lives, maybe even your life? Have you ever tasted God's goodness and mercy? Maybe at the communion table or maybe at another feast where you just saw God's presence. People, God is love and God is light in a world that needs love and light. And that love and light is the source of our abundant living, personally and communally. We cannot tell everyone that God should be their light or God's love should reign in their set of decisions or the choices that they make. But we, personally and communally, can stay connected to God, the source. We can, in our own life, make this what fuels our existence. So in the first part of this letter, this sermon, we get declared that God is indeed present in our world. God is in nature, God is in love, God is in our experience of forgiveness and our feeling grace. Do you believe this is true? Are you willing to let that truth soak in you today, this week, this season? You see, believing in God not only means believing that God created, it also means that God continues to create. It doesn't just happen back there. It happens now. God's love and light is everywhere. Will we open our eyes and see it? Will we desire to taste it, to feel it, to long for it? This is the message of this first chapter in 1 John. See, my mom, even though she didn't say anything profound, or I didn't really respond, very profoundly, or even probably nicely. My mom disrupted my pattern of thinking when she came and asked me. And in the midst of all the stuff, she gave me a little light. She reminded me that these were my friends. Asked me, invited me to think, is this thing, whatever it is, worth it? And she helped me find my way forward as awkward as eighth graders navigate anything in life. 
And I think she gave me the courage to get over my pride and go back into that community that I longed for. First John also reminds us we are not God. If we think we are, we deceive ourselves, right? So division will, e will emerge. And I think it has greater room to jump into communities when we don't connect ourselves to God. So the more disconnected we are from God's love and light, the more apt we are to live under this deception. The truth is, we're called to love God and our neighbor. Remaining connected and grafted to God's love and light is how we do that. So today, rather than challenge you in your life this week, I want to give a thank you. My experience at Lutheran Church of Peace has been this is a community that seeks in all it does to stay connected to God's love and light. You, we do that as we find ways to embody that love through meals, through conversations, to listen to each other's stories and hurts, to pray for each other's joys and sorrows. And as we do, we point we, and we shine that love and that light. So my hope and prayer is that we may continue to be a community grafted in to that love and light so that the light of Christ may shine in and through us, in our relationships, in the, in the ministry, in the actions of this community, so that others too may know this truth, that the God made known in Jesus loves them immensely and has wishes for their life. Amen. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. The beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus.
Please stand and join me in our statement of belief found in your bulletins. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of early morning sunrises and late evening sunsets, thank you for your gift of creation, for the way the wind brushes on across our face, for the feel of grass as we picnic by the lake, or the smell of campfires on cool summer evenings and the laughter that erupts in conversations with family and friends. Your creation is all around us. Help us to see, feel, and touch the beauty of creation and open ourselves to the simple blessings of this season. Lord, in your mercy. God, you speak about the importance of loving you and our neighbors, yet it is hard to do so. We're easily distracted, busying ourselves with tasks that don't matter, chasing dreams that don't provide meaning, and ignoring the people closest to us. Show us a different way. Help us navigate political differences and listen to others who have ideas other than our own. Open our imagination as we seek nonviolent solutions to deep-seated hurts and injustices. Loving God, 
provide patience for travelers who've had their plans disrupted as a result of the global technology issue. Thank you for the dedicated staff who are working to resolve issues and accommodate travelers and remind us over and over again of how interconnected our lives are with people near and far. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, you care about all of our lives, our physical needs, our relationships, our emotional state. Heal us where we need healing. Restore what needs restoring and mend what is broken so that our lives may be renewed and we may be reminded of your redeeming presence. As a community, we pray for Adam Martin and all who knew and loved Adam's mother, Ruth. Comfort them with the sure knowledge that Ruth is safe and secure in your loving arms. We pray for the Sartains, both recovering from surgery, and for Nancy Brown, recovering from knee surgery and a hairline spinal fracture. Grant them complete, pain-free healing. God, we are so grateful that your love for us knows no bounds, that you place no limits on our prayers of petition. We praise you and thank you for Jonathan and Nico's successful surgeries and for Melissa's baby, Antonio, who is home now. And loving God, we boldly beg you to continue to bless Jonathan, Nico, Antonio, and Melissa with healing and strength so that they can grow into happy, successful adults who mirror your love to the world. We pray in thanksgiving for Julie and all who have summer birthdays, no matter how young or old they are. Let all your people everywhere know your special love for them and let us all be your light and love to the world. Meet us, God, in our uncertainty. Be light in dark times. Bring joy as we celebrate and always surround us with grace and mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Thank you for the gift of this community, for the ways we support each other with prayer, and for the way we see each other and take time to listen to each other's stories. Thank you for the way we help each other incorporate faith into our everyday lives. As we come to your table this day, meet us. Renew our hearts and empower us to be your light to the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, we pray. Amen. And now as we prepare to come to God's table to share in this meal, hear these words of grace. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, this is the new covenant of my blood given for you and all people for their forgiveness of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. Let us now pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. For those of you communing online, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of you community here on Century Avenue, we will begin um, on the sides in the front to the back and then from the back to the front. We have two stations. Uh, on my right will be the one with gluten-free. As you come up, go through, there's a basket for your empty cups and return to your seat. Children are welcome. I invite you to come. All is ready. Let's pray. 
Oh God, we give you thanks that you've set before us this feast, the body and blood of your son. By your spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. And now I invite all that are able to stand and to join in our closing hymn, 774, What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine. Now, the, may the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.